So my name is Alan. Um, I currently I work in Spokio, so which is a social network for. So when you come in, you want to search something like people's, like your friends or anything that related to a person specifically in social network. So you can come into our site and search for it. So uh, I graduated from um, UCLA for my uh, bachelor's, got my master's here at Cal Poly Pomona. I think everything's the same except the parking, which is pretty terrible. <laughs> so let's get started. So here's the overview of what I'm going to talk about. So what is a social network and why is it valuable? And what, like, if we want to analyze it, what algorithm should we use and how, how do we do it? So also, why do we do it? What are some real world applications for it? Also, I'm going to talk about the privacy concerns that a lot of people have regarding like the public data that you publish online every day. So what is a social network? So by default, a network is a graph. So in a graph, there are vertices which are called nodes. So in a social network, it's just individuals who actually you know, publish contents. Also there are edges, which is the relationship between two different nodes. So basically, for example, on Facebook, if you poke someone or if you chat with someone, that's basically a, a, that's basically a link between you and him. So that's the relationship link, linkage. So here there's an example about what a kindergarten social network is. Say like Sarah is really popular, knows about half of the kids, whereas Michael only knows two of the kids. This is a social network in real life. So it doesn't have to be digital. Social network is actually, it's in our human society. It, just like every day we interact with people, people are social, right? You don't just stay at home the whole day and just like, oh, I'm just gonna be in here enjoying my life. So everybody go out and interact. So that's the, that's the interaction is building up the social network. So examples of social network that we know is email. Like a lot of people don't think email is a social network, but it is, it is the original social network. So by default, if you send someone an email, you're connecting with them. You're basically, in the, in the graph sense, you're linking you and him. So there's a linkage between you two. So as the technology advances, so we have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and WhatsApp. Although they give the they give the nodes different names. For example, Facebook uses friends, Twitter uses followers, LinkedIn uses connections. But essentially, in a graph sense, they are just nodes. Reddit, I have no clue how it works. I just started using it. It's awesome. So why do we care about social networks? First of all, like, let's say, why, why do people join social network? It's because they want to be connected, right? The sense, they don't want to feel like they are left out. So let's read this graph. Facebook right now have about 1.7 billion users. So that's about like one fifth of the entire population on the planet Earth, which is a lot of people when you think about it. So such a large user base contains a lot of valuable information. For example, if you want to do a study about, you know, adults from 20 to 30 years old, what do they like? This is a perfect example where we can use Facebook data to analyze it and come up with a report. So also social network, if you have a lot of users, you can actually broadcast message much more easier. So if you know, or I'm not sure if you know or not, Trump actually wins the election, but Facebook is actually not supporting him. So if you know Facebook is actually supporting Hillary, there's a lot of negative uh, comments about to Trump. So that message can reach out because Facebook have a really large user base. It's like if there's another social, work, social network like uh, Instagram, maybe there's a lot of users, but most people there do not care, care about the politics. So that's why like we really want to actually focus on specific social network instead of just anyone. Social network that are, have a lot of users, have large reach of user base, those are the ones that are really important. So another question is, social networks are valuable, but how much do you worth to them? So like this is a little bit outdated information, but uh, roughly it's still the same. So to, to Spotify, you're worth about like 170 bucks as of uh, November, 2013. For Facebook, you're worth about 100, 
and uh, 30 bucks. That's back in 2013. Right now it's about 70 bucks. So I just did research this morning, it's about 70 bucks. That's not too bad. So why do people actually assign a value to a spe specific user? It's because of the social network have really a lot of power. They can like publish content, they can have, do advertisement, all sorts of things. So that's why like investors actually assign a value to this social network users. So if we want to do social network analysis, like what, what exactly is it? It's basically organizational interaction analysis. Believe it or not, this analysis is actually not developed by computer scientists first. It's actually developed by sociologists and anthropologists first. Because they want to understand how the family structure works and how the interaction between like humans work. So they come up with the social network analysis sort of thing. So it could be manual or it could be computer assisted. Meaning like you can sit down and basically draw out every, per every person you know. Or you can just go on Facebook and check all your friend list. So either way, actually, it's going to work. But uh, computer assisted have way more aspects of the, in the entire picture. So I'm going to get into a little bit of graph theory. So in the graph we talked about earlier, we have uh, vertices, which are nodes, and uh, edges, which are the linkages between them. So when we're talking about a node, we want to know like how the node is connected with others. Essentially, we want to know the popularity of the node. So that's why we, we have a concept of degree centrality. So it's basically the number total number of connections from this node going into this node or going out of this node. So the more connection that you have, actually, the more valuable actually you are in a graph sense. So let's, let's take uh, Twitter, for example. One guy might have like a million users, and another user just follow a million other people. So which one's more important? The guy who has a million followers, right? Because he can broadcast a message to a million other people, whereas the other one just gets message from a million different people. So that weight, actually, you can calculate specifically that weight. People who has more followers are more valuable than people who follow more people. So there's another thing that we use is called closeness centrality. It's basically, let's take a look at this picture first. So let's say we want to know, let's say Lisa wants to know Bob. How can Lisa know Bob? So Lisa has to know, know Alan first and then know Liz. Then from Liz, there's a, few, a couple of ways to know Bob. So basically, she has to jump through at least one, two, three, four, four other people to know Bob. So basically, from Lisa to Bob, there's just four hops. So the distance between them in the graph sense is just four hops. Let's go back here. Also, think of it. The communication between Lisa and Bob, because they're so far away. So basically, if Lisa want to actually get a message to Bob, Lisa has to go through all of these people. Have you guys ever played a game called Telephone? So basically, if the message, the, the longer the distance is, the further apart they are, and the harder it's to actually relay a message from Lisa to Bob. And also, there's, it's more error pro. There may be more things that can go wrong during the path. So a third concept that was called betweenness centrality. It's basically saying that how important is a node? So if you're if you're in a graph, like some nodes are really important because they're vital to the graph. If you remove that node, the graph doesn't work anymore. Some nodes are leaf nodes. They can be removed easily and they still don't affect overall how the graph works. So let's take another example. So let's say in an organization person A and person D all made a mistake, but in the organization, A has his job between two departments where the red is like accounting, the blue is the human resource, D is basically just an intern, like they made the same mistake. So we're going to make example, we're going to fire a guy, so who do we fire? So clearly we're going to fire D because D has no like outgoing 
T has no outgoing connections. So in a graph sense, T's between A's centrality is lower than A. So that's just an example. So now let's talk about data mining to social networks after all these things. So what, what are we trying to do in social network data mining? We're trying to actually get user profiles as much as possible. So that's basically my daily job. So what we do is each user have a Facebook account, they have a Twitter account, they have multiple social network accounts. So you want to actually aggregate them at just for a specific user so it's much easier to look it up. Also want to know like a lot of the uh, aspect about the user, like who is the most popular guy on Twitter or who is the most popular guy on Facebook, things like that. So we also want to find out what, what nodes are actually crucial to the entire social network. For example, like Vine is dying, but do you know why it's dying? Exactly, because a lot of good Viners, they left Vine. So they are the crucial part of the network, but they left essentially the linkage between that broadcaster and the viewers just died. So the social network essentially dies because of that linkage died. So we also want to anal uh, analyze the different groups in w in inside the social network. So we don't want to treat like a Facebook the same, the, the same way we treat uh, a Twitter account. Because Facebook is somehow like it's more valuable. People use Facebook for day-to-day -day stuff, but you only use Twitter for if they see something really cool or something. But so we group them separately, even though it's indexed under the same user ID, but it should be different groups. So here's an example of um, cluster grouping. Think of each one as a different network. So let's say blue one is Facebook. That's in a square, red square. The red one may be Pinterest. The other one may be LinkedIn, whatever. But like in Facebook, we can put a link to Pinterest, right? So in a graph sense, like the individual user in it can actually draw a line between him and the Pinterest. But we don't want to do that because data collection wise, it's really costly to draw so many edges. It's much easier to group the users first and then draw the connection between the groups. So storage wise, you save a lot of the unnecessary, you save a lot of data. So right now, like everything's stored in the cloud, right? Everything costs money. So essentially, if you want to store linkage, essentially they just uh, become objects. But how do you minimize the objects? You can use like, think of database wise, you can group all the users first, then link all the groups. Essentially, you can cut down on how many linkage or how many connections that you have. So basically, if you want to connect to the outside, you have to know which group you are in, then use the group connections to get to other users. So to connect, to collect all those data, we need to actually have a robust system. Right now, there, there's really two things, cloud computing and distributed system computing. So the one that I use at work is distributed computing. We actually use a lot of Amazon infrastructure because it's getting cheaper and cheaper to like rent an Amazon computer, an Amazon instance, rather than just buy like really expensive hardware. So basically for distributed computing, the components are actually located on the same network, but they're different computers. If they're not the s within the same hardware, they're different hardwares, but they're just networked for communication purposes. They can work individually and they can handle error individually, which means one guy stops working, doesn't stop the other guys working. So basically this is one of the advantages of a distributed computing system. So this is just an example of how it actually works. So let's say a client makes a request, it goes to the switch, the switch says, oh, I don't have this information, what should I do? Then it asks the master about what to do. The master then sends a query to the switch, the switch then broadcasts it, and then it broadcasts it to all the slaves. And then the slaves collects all the data and then answers the query for the users. So this is one of the overall views of how distributed system works. So let's talk about the pros and cons. What are the advantages? First of all, it ha you, you have a lot of uh, resources at your hands. You have multiple computers, like each one can be really powerful. And then all those, 
all those individual machines are not actually shared by users. They're just dedicated for doing what they're supposed to do. And then if you try to do something, it's really speedy. But what, what are the drawbacks? So basically on each of those machines, you have concurrent processes on the run different pro on running on different processors. So basically, if two machines try to talk to each other, there's going to be a lot of barriers because process processes like they're not threats. Like basically, they're just in their own world doing their own little thing. They're just supposed to do their thing. They're not supposed to communicate that well. I mean, I guess you could, but it's going to make it a lot tougher to communicate between the two separate distributed systems. So once we have multiple machines, you have multiple controls, point of controls, which also means multiple point of failures. If something goes wrong, if, let's say if you have a thousand machines and all of a sudden your, your program is not working, you have to go through each log in each machine and see which one failed and why it failed. So it just makes the entire software development a little bit harder because once, once your program become like parallel, then debugging it, it's just a pain. Like, so I can give a solid example, like when we're doing data uh, da data import from um, Twitter, so we have like about 20 instances running on Amazon. So about 18 of them worked, two of them didn't. So how to find out why those two does not work. So essentially I have to go through each one of the IPs log SSH into the box and find out that essentially those two are just have a bad like a Twitter authentication token, but all the others have updated authentication token. So this does make debugging a little bit painful, but it's not really like totally unhandleable. So the the, the advantages the advantages still outweigh the the cons. So why do distributed system works in collecting data? So one of the theory is called covenant. Uh, sorry, combinatorial topology. I don't even know how to say the word. So basically, you have like multiple machines, right? Each machine to have its own computational power. Every machine is not born the same. Let's say some have a large instance, some have a small instance. So basically, the efficiency rate is different. So some some machine can handle the task pretty quick. Like if you give them like import data from Facebook, they can get it done like in 10 seconds, whereas the other get it done like in one minute. So you have this cluster of things and you have like a bunch of tasks. How do you allocate it? How do you allocate it efficiently so that the overall speed is fast? So that's why when this theory come in and it actually calculates if you get a task this large, go to this computer, finish it. If you get a task that's this small, do this. So this theory actually takes care of all the mathematics behind the scene for a distributed system. I'm not going to go into the details. It's pretty... I don't even understand like most of it. So we also use a lot of MapReduce. Think of MapReduce as divide and conquer. You have a large problem. You don't know the immediate answer to this question, but you can break it down to smaller chunks, smaller chunks. Essentially, it just becomes so trivial. Like you can just say, hey, one plus one equals two. So that's the concept of how MapReduce works. So it also requires a lot of machines and also it's meant for large scale data analysis, which is perfect for social network data collection. So here's one example of how MapReduce works. So let's say if you have a text file and you want to count exactly each word, how many times it appears in the word, right? So basically you're saying, oh, I, this is too big of a file. I don't know what to do. So basically you hand the large file to someone, let's split it into three smaller files, right? And each one have like a couple of words in it. And so when the splitting happens, then we start mapping. So mapping is basically the on the atom level, what computation are trying to do. So like, for example, in this mapping sense, the first file just have three words. Each one of them has just like one appearances. So that's the mapping. Once after the mapping is done, you want to actually sort the result based on what you're trying to do. Like in this, in this example, you're just sorting the words basically based on how they're spelled like. So words with the same spells actually gets grouped together. So you get, so you get a group one, two, three, and four with bear, car, deer, and river. So once after shuffling is done, which we come to our 
next part was re which is reducing reducing not necessarily means like just adding up like this is just the one example but essentially you're making the bigger input into smaller files calculate the result individually and then get individual for each of the small parts you get the last part is basically just merge the result that you have which is the merging part so you have you have your input you have your output so it's essentially like divide and conquer you just merge the result in the very end here's a pseudo code of how it actually so basically you have an input file and then you split the input file into a matrix then you take each row and do the do the mapping which is essentially count the word and then you want to actually in the very end sum up all of the count for each row and return it so anyone would take a guess what's the runtime in terms of big O notation it's definitely not linear <laughs> all right actually I don't know either so I actually look it up so basically it's n log n times s times p so n is the number of items you're trying to do basically it's the number of words that's in a file s is the number of distributed nodes how many machines do you have in this case it's three and p is the pin time between nodes so basically in the communication the network latency that you have to calculate this problem so there are a lot of problems that we face in data collection like let's say um, let's say profile for example like you just, you don't just have one social network right you have like your Facebook account your Twitter account like you're a bunch of other like Yahoo accounts but you probably use the same email right for all of them so how do we how can we aggregate the accurate information based on this like the short answer is there's really no quick way we have to do a lot of data analysis basically to to say hey this is a Facebook account this is a Twitter account they are actually the same user it's not necessarily like stream matching like if they have the same email it's gonna be more complicated than that so what we have is called like a fuzzy matching profile fuzzy matching so it not only compares the name like system ID emails it does a bunch of other crazy stuff like like on one social network your name may be like John Doe on the other network your name may be John K Doe so you inserted the middle name like but that shouldn't still make a difference though so another thing that we do a lot is data normalization like once when you when we get data from two different parts or two or more different sources what if there are a lot of conflicts such as like on Facebook you say your age is like 26 right but on like LinkedIn you say you're like 50 years old so when we get those two information what do we do so this also requires a lot of um, analysis basically when we get a different source of truth we have to compare what's the average one the average so basically if one is really like outlier from the entire group that one definitely needs to be fixed so data normalization also take a lot of computation um, so everything we we get from the internet we, we use the crawlers to get them we don't store them as is we actually sanitize it and then store it so that computation eventually end up costing us more money than just actually write the hire the developers and do it essentially all the data that's costing most of the money data storage so once when we have all this information a huge problem because we essentially in, in the first we actually store it in MySQL which is the relational database which is what we learn in school it's pretty cool it's pretty fast but end up actually it's becoming a drawback because every time you do a query like say I want to select every user that has a Facebook account who is 25 years old and she likes cartoon or he likes cartoon so when we do that join join after join and then it's eventually start choking so we actually migrated to Cassandra which is a NoSQL database so it does have its advantage and disadvantages advantages that it's key value store basically whatever you need you just pass in a key it'll give you the right value right away in terms of big O notation it's really fast big O of one but to store the data you need to design your key your basically you need to design your key really smart 
so that you can query it later. So you, you need to embed the MySQL join part into the key, which is another challenge. So eventually, we <laughs> were just we're saying like, pure MySQL is not going to work. Pure Cassandra is not work. We eventually end up with two, a hybrid of two. So for all the things that we don't care about relational relation stuff, we just put them into Cassandra. Everything that we do care about relation stuff, we store them into MySQL, and then we add caching layers on top of that to, to speed up uh, lookups. So data collection is essentially what, what I do at work. How can I get quality data? How to maintain it and how to make it you know, really, really fast to search. So, so there are a lot of real world applications for this. A lot of the things that we want to know, like that, that's not available to us. For example, you, you publish a lot of tweets, right? But do you know which tweets is the most read by your followers? It's not necessarily the most retweeted ones. Someone may see your tweet but never retweets it. So this kind of question we can answer. Like, which one of your Facebook friends have the most crazy political view? Like, he or she just likes Trump that much, saying, hey, you should be president. So. <laughs> Also, like, if we have this lot of information, like from, um, if we have the data from Amazon, we can do better product recommendations. So, the the more data that we have, the more questions that we can answer, like what what kind of user base you have, how can we group it, and how like, how like, for for example, for advertisement, how should you spend your money? So a lot of people are concerned about data collection. Like, do you guys know that when you click, uh, when you sign up for Facebook, you actually give up your rights, your privacy rights. Anything you do on Facebook is actually belong to Facebook. Anybody see the episode in South Park? Kyle just uh, signs the thing from Apple. <laughs> so basically, that's what happened to us. So we signed the agreement to Facebook. They have a full, like, for example, Google. They still have everything that we do online as their properties. Everything that we do is, we say it's private, maybe we can control some aspect of it, but most of it we cannot control. Like, right now you don't know how many ads tracking are on your phone. Like, even though like I disabled my ads tracking, but I, I'm sure that I still see a lot of advertisement. So, people are making money off of you, but you just don't know. A lot of advertisers track you every day, what you click, what you do online. But do, do you really, like, like a lot of people are really concerned, but most of the time we don't realize, like, the issue. Like, show of hands, do you really care about what you do online? Like, people track you and do you mind that or you don't mind that? If you mind that, raise your hands. Yeah. So basically, we have a, a opt-out form for a lot of users that in our system. This is not true for every other social network. So basically for us, if you want to opt out, be completely erased from the system, you can do that in, in our system, but not in Facebook and uh, Google. I don't know if they ever offer it though. Right. Any questions? Only if there's a linkage between the two. We don't just randomly connect groups. Because most of the case that when a user exists, the user should belong to a group, right? So like I said, if you try to connect a user to the another group or a user to another user, that's going to increase the, story, the storage. So every linkage is actually a row in the database, right? You don't like, let's say, you are connected to 250 other Facebook users, right? You don't want to have like 256 rows just for your connection in a database. Whereas you should just say, okay, I'm belonging to Facebook, and then this 256 users belong to like Facebook and Twitter. So you can essentially get to them through the through a MySQL join instead of just storing everything yourself. Yeah. Any other questions?
So we have a lot of mechanisms. So first of all, you, if you want to crawl like a social network, you should have their agreements, right? So we have agreements from Facebook. We have their uh, API token. So basically, any information that's coming from Facebook should be belong to the Facebook group. But that's not true all the time because people post on Facebook so many other things. Like people post on Facebook about like Pinterest, about LinkedIn, job posts. Everything can be on Facebook. So the source of truth is that when we get a profile or, for example, a page, we're actually going trace back to the root where it's coming from. Because it, it may be redirecting in between like 10 times. Essentially, it end, end up on the server. And then we just see what kind of group that can, it can be categorized into. Like Facebook, if you click on it, it opens up like the Facebook uh, timeline, right? Pinterest, it opens up like whatever you paint. So essentially, when the redirection stops, that's where we actually check and see where it ends up. So that's the final group it's falling into. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, I can't explain that. So basically, we have a lot of users. So roughly like, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's definitely coming to a point when a user try to do a query in our system, you see the network cost like five seconds. That's pretty bad for an enterprise application. So to, to actually reduce that, we use Memcache on top of the Rails, uh, like Ruby on Rails. So what that does is that basically if you're making the same request to the server with the same, let's say, if you're searching by name, right, John Doe, so you shouldn't interact with the database every time when John Doe is searched. So basically you should cache that MySQL result into some caching service, which is memcache in this case. So when a client sends a request, it's gonna hit the memcache first instead of going directly to the MySQL connection. So essentially you're send, saving a lot of uh, database interactions, unnecessary ones. So only when the cache is not set, let's say the cache is not warmed, you, you hit uh, a name for the first time, then it goes to the database and look up all the things it needs it. Then it stores into the cache. Next time someone look for the same name, it would be returned right away instead of doing the unnecessary queries. Any other questions? Yeah. That's a really good question. So we actually did a research most people, like we have, we have different products. First of all, like celebrities, right? We store them constantly. We update them almost every day, like Taylor Swift, like everywhere she go, we update. So <laughs> it's a little bit too much. Anyway, so a lot of the things are, a lot of things are cached and they're hit pretty frequently. Only this rent, like people from Russia, like we we'll search their name, it's definitely not gonna be in the system. That's the first time we actually go out spin an instance of a crawler, go through all the different social networks, and then connect them, then store them in the cache. So for that one, it's pretty slow. Like if you search a, a new name that's never been in the system before, it could take up to like five seconds for the entire trip to come back a, a result. So five seconds is actually pretty bad. So, because people get used to how fast Google works. Like if you search something, it's instantaneously available, right? So if a, a person is not in your database, essentially you have to go out, grab all the information for him, and then store them into your database, then present it into your front end. Also depending on what kind of presentation layer you use. Like we use Angular 2, which is the latest framework from Google. So it's really efficient in interacting with Ruby on Rails, but still it's, if someone's not available in the database, you gotta, you gotta do the hard work, look it up, store it, and then present it. Any other questions?